So welcome. Welcome to our symposium on creating a healthcare system for the 21st century. I'm Maureen Smith, and I'm the director of the UW Health Innovation Program. Many of you I know already know me. Um, we in the Health Innovation Program, for those of you who don't know us, are a group of investigators from cr across campus who are really focused on solving the problems faced in transforming our healthcare system for the future. And one of the potential transforming factors for our system in this century is the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010. And so today we're going to have a conversation with Congresswoman Tammy Baldwin, who's one of the architects of the Affordable Care Act. After that, I invite you all to wander through the poster session, which is right outside the door. Uh, the other thing you might want to check out when you're over there is the real trees that are growing inside the building. And this poster session is going to highlight some of the work of the investigators from the Health Innovation Program. Now, the work that these investigators do is called health services research, which some of you've heard of and some of you probably haven't heard of. I'm often asked what health services research is, and I can provide you with a technical definition about how we study how people get access to healthcare providers and healthcare services, we study how much healthcare costs, and we study what happens to patients as a result of this care. And another way of thinking about health services research is we hope to provide evidence about the best ways to design the healthcare system in the future. But most people don't connect very well with these definitions. And probably that's because it was constructed by health services researchers, and researchers sometimes don't connect very well with somebody who's not a researcher. So another way to describe what we do is to think about the challenges that are faced by a typical patient in the healthcare system. And I can think about one I know very well. That's my mother. My mother's had diabetes all of her life, and as she's gotten older, she now has heart disease. <clears throat> so every month, she goes to see a doctor. Sometimes it's a heart doctor, sometimes it's a diabetes doctor, and sometimes it's her primary care provider. And the reality is, almost every time she sees that doctor, they change something. They change a drug, um, they change some recommendation that she has. So if she starts to have something happen, how does she know what to do next? She is faced with a question. Should she call her heart doctor, who changed the medication and she saw three days ago, or should she call her primary care provider? Now, if she calls her heart doctor, they might order some tests and take on figuring out what's going on and see if it's really related to the new heart drug that they put her on. And if it is the new heart drug, that all works out okay. But if it isn't the new heart drug, and it turns out she really should have talked to her primary care provider first, well, now her primary care provider is getting called very late in the ball game, way down the road from what things have been done. So what does a health services researcher think about? We ask the question, what happens if she calls her specialist, the heart doctor, first in this situation? Or what happens if she calls her primary care provider first in this situation? If it turns out that patients are generally better off if they call their primary care doctor, then that provides evidence about how an optimally functioning healthcare system might work. So evidence like this has supported the idea of building a primary care home where your primary care provider coordinates all of the uh, conversations and care provided by all of your specialists. Now, of course, that's a great idea, but getting my mother to call her primary care doctor first can be a little bit of a challenge. And if she, get, and if she calls that primary, the heart doctor first, getting the heart doctor to send her immediately to the primary care doctor can be a little bit of a challenge. And even more, if you think about it, wouldn't it be better if the heart doctor picked up the phone and called the primary care doctor to talk about the changes in the drug and what might be going on? 
And then if you think about it a little bit more, wouldn't it be great if her primary care doctor had time to pick up the phone and talk to the heart doctor for 10 minutes about what's going on? So would my mother be better off if that happened? Maybe, maybe not. That's a health services research question. Would it be cheaper in the long run? Maybe, maybe not. That's a health services research question. But more than that, if it turns out the answers to both these questions are yes, that my mother's better off and overall her care's cheaper, because we kept her out of the hospital when she had that drug side effect, how would we create a health care system with the right incentives, the right payment structure, the right technology, the right relationships, staff, geography, and training so that that single phone call happens? And that's a health services research question, too. So health services researchers care about optimally designing the healthcare system of the future. If that's going to happen, we have to be involved in the critical questions raised by new initiatives like the Affordable Care Act, whose goal is explicitly to begin to transform our healthcare system. So now I'd like to introduce Congresswoman Tammy Baldwin, who helped craft the Affordable Care Act. Congresswoman Baldwin has represented Wisconsin's second congressional district since January 1999. In the 112th Congress, she serves on the Committee on Energy and Commerce, its Subcommittee on Health, and its Subcommittee on Environment and the Economy. She has long been involved in health care debates in this country, authoring laws for blinded veterans, people living with paralysis, and low-income women seeking breast and cervical cancer screening. Born and raised in Madison, Wisconsin, she began her career in public service as a Dane County Board Supervisor and served four terms on the board. She also served briefly on the Madison City Council before being elected to the Wisconsin State Assembly where she served three terms. She's a graduate of Smith College and our own University of Wisconsin Law School. And we're delighted to launch our symposium for the day with a conversation with Congresswoman Baldrum on health care reform. Well, thank you, Maureen, for that wonderful introduction to the topic and your uh, introduction of me. I want to just add a little bit to um, the introduction of me uh, in the sense that I would like some of you to understand where my passion for health care reform uh, comes from and, and health uh, policy in general. Uh, some of you know that I was raised by my grandparents here in uh, Madison. My grandfather was a biochemist on the campus here, and my grandmother was uh, uh, academic staff. She designed costumes for the university theater. It's a great childhood, you know, with that sort of stimulation. But anyways, um, when I was young, uh, about nine years old, I had a very serious childhood illness that resulted in a three-month uh, hospitalization and about a year additional, uh, you know, uh, quite intense uh, uh, clinical care after I was uh, out of the hospital. The good news is I had just access to the top-notch uh, providers, and while it was probably at certain points a life-threatening illness, I uh, did really well. The bad news was that um, my grandparents, both with the university, had a family health policy that uh, defined dependence in a way that didn't include a granddaughter. And so they were faced with medical expenses for a three-month hospitalization and all the follow-up care uh, and had to pay out of pocket. And according to family lore, uh, I was not insured again until I became an adult and was enrolled in my undergraduate uh, uh, college. And uh, that set of events and uh, the discussion in our family and learning of other loved ones and friends who were s suffering similar uh, circumstances uh, made me passionate about this issue, uh, about uh, recognizing the insecurity that lack of coverage can have or the worry that uh, limits on coverage can cause a, 
uh, financial catastrophe um, for a family. I, you heard from Maureen a little bit about my early years in public service, and even you heard that my first office was the Dane County Board of Supervisors, and you said, well, what do they have to do with health care? Well, back in the day that I was elected, uh, the county board ran a program uh, in concert with the state called General Assistance, and General Assistance provided uh, health care for the indigent. And uh, I ran for the county board because I saw two things. Uh, one was many people still not qualifying uh, to participate in the general assistance program when they were truly indigent and ill, particularly college students. Uh, this was before the, the group health policy on campus. And uh, secondly, I saw that that program was under significant threat from the state for a possible elimination, and that proved to be true in the end. But it was the issue of health care coverage for all that brought me to public service, even at the local level, um, before having the honor of being able to work on this issue at the state and, and national level. Now, right, I'm going to talk a lot about um, these political times we find ourselves in. But uh, this year, clearly the debate in Washington, D.C. has focused on uh, the immediate crisis of our struggling and, and uh, our struggling economy, uh, putting people back to work, although I would add insufficient attention to that topic. We've also had our attention drawn uh, to the necessity to cut our debts and reduce our deficits. And the uh, discussion of implementation of the health care reform bill has uh, quieted. But I would argue that it is still absolutely central to our fight to protect the middle class, to our fight to see us um, uh, recover from this deep uh, economic recession. We know that uh, rising health care costs have put a tremendous strain on family budgets, and it also is a huge uh, contributing strain to our national budget. And we know that some of the trends we've experienced, or all of them that we've experienced over recent years, are unsustainable in the long run. Uh, there's ever-increasing pressures to make substantial changes to our system uh, in order to meet uh, growing demand with fewer resources. Uh, too infrequently in the political arena uh, is the question asked of why the health care costs are, uh, are rising so um, quickly as they have over the past few decades. Um, but I think all of you know too well uh, that the payment incentives that are currently in place in our national policies um, tend towards rewarding quantity over quality of health care. And there are too few incentives in place for health care providers to be inspired to work collaboratively as teams to improve the delivery of, of health care. Now, Maureen talked about uh, the recent passage of the Patient Protection and uh, Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act took some critically important steps in changing the status quo and moving us in a new direction in which we focus on quality and cost effectiveness instead of simply quantity. The Affordable Care Act includes demonstration and pilot projects to reform our current payment system to provide, uh, to move past a, a simple fee-for-service model to a system that incents quality and collaboration. Some of these uh, demonstrations and pilots include the following. Uh, you've probably heard discussions recently of accountable care organizations. ACOs, as they are known, are intended to allow healthcare providers to work collaboratively as a team to manage patients' care. Teams that would provide high quality care at a lower cost over time. And the reason one would want to participate as an institution in an affordable care organization is that if they are successful, the organization gets to return, re retain a fairly significant percent of the savings accrued from that 
high quality uh, uh, collaboration. Uh, there's a concept called payment bundling. The Affordable Care Act proposes to restructure incentives by providing payments for episodes of care rather than paying for each separate service provided. Um, this is hoped to change the way that physicians and institutions uh, approach uh, patient treatment. I, I listened with interest uh, to Maureen talking about her mother. I have a mother story too, and, and it, which, which sort of, uh, it, to me, brought home both the idea of, of bundling and accountable care organizations and medical home as, as it's often known. My, my mother had a hospitalization in another state. I will add, uh, a few years ago, and uh, she entered with a, uh, a lung infection and uh, had gotten sick enough that she also presented with some confusion. And as I was trying to stay abreast of her care from some distance, I would talk to five physicians. I would talk to her pulmonologist, the infectious disease specialist, the hospitalist, the neurologist, and her primary care physician who wasn't associated with the hospital at which she was admitted. That was just to try to track what was happening, and I thought, uh, we have a long way to go. And she was in a city which is known for very high quality care. The Affordable Care Act also uh, has provisions that are meant to encourage new innovative models that perhaps members of Congress hadn't even thought of, but that people like you are trying to think of and establish. It establishes new programs within Medicare and Medicaid to identify and develop best practices and new delivery models to disseminate this information across the country. And this includes better managing the care of some of our most um, expensive patients those that we know as dual eligibles, people who are eligible for both Medicaid and Medicare. Uh, Maureen and I were talking before the program began about the is a typical 17 years between innovation and uh, mass application of, of that. Uh, this particular provision of the Affordable Care Act is intended specifically to reduce that uh, timeline to be able to rapidly see when something is working in one area of the country or one medical uh, establishment and, and be able to replicate it uh, faster than uh, previously when it had to come back before Congress and get uh, uh, reauthorized. Uh, also a key part of the Affordable Care Act is increasing uh, the collection of healthcare data. Uh, we know that in order to improve quality health outcomes, we need more data in order to determine what works and what doesn't. And under the um, uh, ACA, uh, this will be collected, evaluated, and analyzed to determine best practices with partners like uh, many of you in this room. Now, these reforms within the Affordable Care Act are critical to improving our health care system. By realigning payment incentives, we can reward quality, encourage collaboration, and reduce waste, and ultimately achieve the target goal of bending the healthcare cost curve. Um, but what's happening now that we have passed the Affordable Care Act? It's approximately a year and a half since we've passed the bill, and an election has intervened. And instead of working together to implement these vital reforms and test out these demonstration and pilot projects, we have seen some very vocal opposition to the bill in its entirety at the federal and state level, I might add. And there have been a lot of efforts to simply block implementation of this measure in its entirety. Past January, this past January, when uh, the 112th Congress convened, the very first bill that the new majority in the House of Representatives moved to the floor was an effort to repeal the entire health care law. Since then, uh, that bill did, by the way, pass the House, but is stalled, I think, permanently in the U.S. Senate. Um, since then, uh, there has been a focus of energy and effort on repealing 
aspects, provisions of the entire bill rather than trying to repeal the bill in its entirety. And where those have come up short, there have been additional efforts to defund provisions of the bill so they'd be empty if there's no dollars following to uh, make them a reality. Um, as an aside, I, I want to just go back to uh, what's happened before when we've passed major health care policies. Um, back in, you know, this is an aside and a parallel. Um, back in 2003, uh, we had an epic debate on the um, uh, Medicare Modernization Act, which created a program called Medicare Part D, the prescription drug benefit for uh, seniors. And it did a number of other things also. Um, it was very controversial and fairly partisan. While it didn't go exactly along part party lines, the debate centered around whether in Medicare the prescription drug benefit should be privatized benefit or operate more or less the way Medicare, the rest of it, did. So that was one of the keys to the debate. And the other was that the bill was sent to the floor without funding. Uh, so it was not paid for, it was borrowed for. Uh, and that created a, a huge partisan divide with many Democrats, myself included, opting to vote no. But once enacted, I just want to point out, and this is why I bring it up, that there wasn't a huge effort to then repeal it, to then defund it, to then block the effective implementation of the program. Rather, people pulled together and said, this is what we have, this is the law that was passed, let's make the best of it. And I, I see um, such a, I am so disappointed that the same could not occur uh, this time around, uh, a year and a half later, or a year and a half after the passage of the Affordable Care Act. It's not only in Washington that we're seeing political games being played with the implementation of the um, Affordable Care Act. Uh, here in Wisconsin, shortly after the midterms, our new governor uh, authorized the filing of suit against the bill to see it declared, uh, as he was hoping to see it declared unconstitutional. Um, he has also, uh, along with his health secretary, uh, turned back uh, several large federal grants aimed at assisting with various aspects of implementation of the Affordable Care Act, including funds that would help consumers navigate the health insurance system that is going to be made available by the Affordable Care Act when up and running in 2014. I, I would say also that uh, the governor, along with the legislature, um, have proposed uh, the possibility and prospect of redefining eligibility and benefit levels for those who participate in our Medicaid programs, which are state and federal partnerships, and are a key part of making the Affordable Care Act a success when fully implemented. I, I want to just tell you one story that I was very involved in um, that shows how partisan politics um, can trump good policy. Uh, we know that one of the factors that contributes greatly to the cost of our health care system is the amount we spend on end-of-life care. Uh, while there are many challenging decisions for uh, patients to be made at this time, physicians are often uncertain how to proceed because the patient did not leave any advance directive, did not discuss with a family member what they wanted done, uh, uh, what sort of treatment, what level of intervention they wanted. And talking to patients about how they would like to be treated in various scenarios, in various circumstances, at the end of their life, is simply not a current service that is re reimbursed uh, in Medicare. So it, while we were in committee and we were drafting the Affordable Care Act on the House side, I worked with colleagues on both sides of the party aisle on a, a, a bill uh, that would allow Medicare to compensate physicians and nurses for engaging in discussions about advanced planning with patients, if possible, long before any imminent situation uh, was presenting itself. In addition, I sought uh, uh, public education programs so that 
uh, nonprofit organizations across the country could educate in their communities about how important these conversations would be. Uh, after working with uh, my Republican colleagues on a bill to be introduced, we had a more immediate opportunity to offer these ideas as an amendment to the Affordable Care Act as it came through committee. And uh, I presented an amendment in my committee uh, about these uh, educational outreach opportunities to tell people about the importance of advanced planning and discussing your wishes with family and uh, reducing those to writing in important documents that would be shared with your health care providers. The amendment passed unanimously in my committee on a voice vote in July of 2009. A few weeks later, one of the Republican colleagues who I'd worked very closely with on this language came up to me on the floor and said, do you hear what they're saying on Fox News about our amendment? I said, no, I don't watch Fox News. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, what are they saying about our amendment? He said, they're calling it a death panel. They're talking and you know, tell me more, et cetera. And he, I said, well, you know, what are we going to do? And he said, my advice to you is to go to the chairman and ask him to remove the language from the bill. And I thought, no, we, we've both talked about what an important provision this is, how it will put more control into the hands of patients, how it will help people who are practicing medicine know of their patients' wishes, and we can use our health dollars more effectively at this important stage of um, people's lives. And uh, no, he wouldn't back down. He said, I, uh, I advise you to go tell the chairman that we shouldn't move forward with this. Well, then we had our August recess in 2009. You might remember that that's when this whole debate was amped up uh, incredibly. And uh, by the time we got to the end product, um, people other than me had uh, removed and stripped that provision from the final bill that was uh, talked about uh, what was passed. Um, but I think I, I tell you all these stories and about the political circumstances in Washington right now because it's infuriating that these political games and efforts to bring down the newly passed health care law and to obstruct its um, effective and smooth implementation really leave all stakeholders in the lurch. And that's you in this room and many, many others. Because there's a cloud of doubt lurking over whether the law will be fully implemented. And clearly, many in the health community um, uh, will be less inclined to test out some of the new demonstrations and new pilots that we are urging folks to uh, engage in. And then, of course, it spirals. Without the new evidence that we hope these pilots and demonstrations will provide, um, that uh, uh, new delivery, de delivery models may not be developed, and uh, uh, the path of, of uh, savings and cost effectiveness that would lead to debt reduction will not ultimately happen. Um, I think all of you understand how important it is that we test these ideas, new innovative models. I think that uh, the health uh, care community across the country can learn a lot from what we're doing here in Wisconsin. And I do want to credit folks who aren't waiting for the federal government to get its act together, who are, have for years been pioneers. And we find that across our state, and we find that here at this university and with all of its collab collaborators. Thanks to your individual efforts and those organizations such as ACORN, uh, provisor, providers across Wisconsin have been at the forefront of adopting new innovative models that are high in both quality and value for the patients they serve. Um, we are national leaders in improving care and, and paving the way for a new approach to our healthcare system. And uh, I want to say that I've been uh, lucky as a member of the health committee over the years to be able to tout a lot of the breakthroughs and uh, innovations uh, that we have developed here in my home state 
and incorporated some of those ideas in legislation that's moved through. Um, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we are here celebrating ACORN's 10-year anniversary. Uh, for a decade now, you've been focusing on innovative ways to improve quality and value in our healthcare system. So I want to personally applaud the work that you do and, uh, and express every confidence that you will persevere despite this difficult political climate that we find ourselves in right now. I pledge to you that I will continue to work to implement the reforms that I've been talking about as well as the entirety of the Affordable Care Act um, because we know that testing out these innovative models, particularly on the very large public payers of Medicaid and Medicare, is critical not to only improving quality of care but to strengthening health care for all. Um, so before I take questions, let me just uh, return to a heartfelt um, congratulations to all of you for your participation in health uh, healthcare improvement and uh, in ACORN and uh, congratulations on the celebration of your 10-year anniversary. And with that, I would like to uh, make this a true discussion with a back and forth from all of you. Thank you. First, just, wow, that's loud. <laughs> just want to thank you for your tireless work uh, on behalf of Wisconsin and the whole country and its health. Um, it's, it's, I, <laughs> not to make this political, but I hope that your role in that uh, extends to a new venue as senator. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. I did want to raise... Uh, a question about cost effectiveness and comparative effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And in particular, political challenges, not just from the right who calls it death panels, but also on the left, there's reluctance to changes in Medicare benefits, Medicare payment and coverage on the basis of cost effectiveness. And we saw a hint of that, I think, uh, in a slightly different venue with the uh, mammography screening guidelines for women age 40 to 50, where cost effectiveness was cited as a rationale for not uh, recommending screening or for not, not strongly recommending screening in that age group. And unfortunately, there was not support from the Department of Health and Human Services on that, uh, on that recommendation, and there was a lot of backpedaling. Um, how do you see walking that tightrope? Um, and how do you think we can make comparative effectiveness and cost effectiveness an actual integral part of Medicare coverage and going forward, maybe perhaps part of the exchanges? when it seems that it's an unpopular prospect both on the left and right? It, it certainly will be a challenge. There's no question about that. Um, and when you know, we, we were trying to get even stronger uh, provisions in the underlying bill that I think were, um, well, certainly not as strong by the time the final um, bill was put together. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the, the panel right now that's, uh, but, but basically the one charged with um, a CER uh, that's getting such uh, political flack right now. But basically, for years we've had a group called MedPAC, uh, which provides uh, uh, counsel to both houses of Congress on ways to bend the Medicare uh, cost curve. And uh, yet they have no teeth. Uh, they're advisory, and so if they have a popular recommendation, it's embraced, and if they have an unpopular recommendation, it's rejected. And so in the ACA, what we were able to do is put in um, a panel that had a little bit more uh, authority. It certainly is not a lawmaking entity to itself, but it had more teeth than MedPAC. And, uh, there has been a fair uh, amount of uh, pushback uh, in both the House and the Senate, and as you indicate, uh, on, on bipartisan lines. Uh, part of it has been uh, just the, the composition of the panel and concerns that there's not 
enough medical uh, knowledge uh, on that. Certainly these are, it's mostly composed of people who are healthcare system experts uh, as opposed to uh, people with medical degrees. So perhaps some of that tension could be eased if we look at some modification of the composition of the body just for a, a confidence that, um, that people with adequate scientific preparation are, um, are actually on the committee and not just counsel to the committee. Um, but I do think we're going to have a, a struggle there. Uh, as I heard the debate play out uh, on earlier iterations of that provision in committee, uh, we had uh, we have a couple of uh, physician members of the health subcommittee, uh, Republican physician members, and they were absolutely um, uh, well passionate about not having outside panels telling doctors how to practice medicine. Uh, and um, yet, uh, we know that if you look at how uh, patients access their physicians throughout the country, we know it happens in different. Um, different settings. Solo practitioners in rural America, uh, small group practices, large clinical practices in hospital settings, and access to the latest uh, innovations, access to the latest information on the most effective treatments of certain conditions to somebody who is quite isolated is a challenge. There's lots of ways to drive that. We didn't even, I haven't even talked yet about um, the role that in health information technology and electronic medical records can play. There's also tension, you know, in, in terms of adoption of that. But certainly, um, I think that there's a very beneficial role to play uh, with comparative effectiveness research and delivery of that information into the field. Reform of graduate medical education is very important for health reform. Now, MedPAC has uh, had a very interesting recommendation in terms of what to be done with the indirect medical education um, support of $6.5 billion. And part of that, we feel, relates to teaching health centers. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, teaching health centers are an important part of the ACA. And unfortunately, things have not taken off because of the way teaching health centers are set up in terms of that legislation with uh, the sponsorship of residencies. Um, be interested in your thoughts in terms of what we can do to make the teaching health center legislation work. Uh, and can that be tied in in a way with the MedPAC recommendation to use indirect medical education funds to support teaching health centers? Uh. Big question. Um, I, I go back to the political times we're in right now where, um, I, and, and I, I guess I didn't say this explicitly when I was talking about the roadblocks that have been thrown up to implementation of um, the Affordable Care Act, but um, as we go through just our ordinary appropriations process this year, uh, there have been amendments after amendments to cut funding to different aspects. And so you have, um, you know, on one hand, the signal that the passage of the Affordable Care Act passes with regard to the emphasis on graduate medical education. And then you have the signal that is sent by the day-to-day -day debate going on, especially in the House of Representatives, not so much in the U.S. Senate, um, where they would pull the rug out completely and of course, it sends uh, just the wrong signal to uh, uh, folks who are trying to plan with some sort of certainty, policy certainty, that, that doesn't exist. Um, I, I'm probably not adequately answering your question, but uh, I think you know, a large part of this is just um, understanding that um, we have to transform medical education at the same time as we are transforming the delivery system. And, uh, you know, we don't, ha we have to think about um, the experience that the medical student is getting first in the classroom and then in their um, early uh, practice uh, under supervision. Uh, it doesn't do any help if the practitioners out in the field are, uh, 
you know, transforming their practices, but what you're learning in the classroom and in your early experience is reflective of the old way of practicing medicine. So moving these reforms earlier and earlier is key. Um, I, I just want to uh, add to that um, how important I think it is at this uh, university that the medical school has now become the school of medicine and public health and how two disciplines that used to be siloed and not uh, uh, in conversation are now, because I really think that is key to our transformation. But fighting for a secure funding stream is going to be absolutely critical um, as we move forward. And we know the times that we're in right now are difficult for that. Congresswoman, you make me both very happy and very sad today. Um, I want to be happy. <laughs> you talk about how a program on Fox News resulted in changing the wording in a committee. I would like to know why is it that the American public does not hear frequent and compelling statements about the Affordable Care Act so that there can be a groundswell of support for it to make sure that the Senate passes this. Why don't we do what they do? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I could, could I have another hour or two to, <laughs> to answer that question? With you? Um, no, I, th I think there's a lot of, um, lots of reasons for that. I, I do think you, know, you I mentioned it first, you repeated Fox News. I think it's really important to look at the way um, our news media has transformed over the past decade or so, and where people are getting information about the public policy debates of our day. Uh, the traditional say print media has su suffered mightily in this recession and even before their business model is not what it used to be and the ranks of beat reporters covering Congress, covering the state legislature, covering your local governments are shadows of what they used to be. That without a strong press, how can you have a strong democracy? Filling in a vacuum that's created there has been much more a sort of entertainment media that purports to report the news. So you have something called Fox News. You also have the emergence of something you know, like MSNBC. I would say both um, could be characterized more as entertainment news media. They're not really reporters, or sorry, trained journalists, but more charismatic hosts with um, very good what they call bookers, who can bring in interesting guests who are going to have uh, exciting talks. But that is not the same as old-fashioned reporter getting in there, learning all about the issue, and reporting it to a public. And we're lacking that these days. So we now have politicians talking through new venues, new ways. But I'm very concerned about the state of the media and how it is we get the truth out. Um, I would say to you that during that debate, I was furiously talking about the issues, not only the issue of how important end-of-life planning and advance um, directives are, but other provisions that were in threat. You know, did you get a chance to hear that? There's only one paper in the state of Wisconsin that has a reporter in Washington, D.C., the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, one full-time reporter. When I was first elected to Congress, there were three, Capital Times, Wisconsin State Journal, and the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Um, so things have changed, and we've got to adapt, and I would say that um, they've been more successful than we have. Um, and I interpret that how you would like. Uh, I don't want to be too partisan, but those who would like to stop this have been more successful. I think the other thing you're seeing right now is that uh, they've been su successful in moving from uh, a characterization of the Affordable Care Act and attacks on that to 
uh, a new crisis, the, cr the debt crisis. Um, well, when I talk to people that I represent, they're talking to me about their daily struggles. And a part of that is health care and the affordability of health care and the worries and security that they lack because of where we are in our system right now. And, and part of it is just the struggle with jobs that, that people are, are experiencing right now and falling behind in bills and worrying about sending their kids to college, et cetera. Um, so you've seen their mastery at bringing your attention to something here when the reality on the ground is stuff we're here to talk about is still the central concern to the people. And as long as that's the case, we're still hopeful. You said you were feeling sad and, and excited at the same time. As long as we're still working on the issues that are of central concern to the people, um, we have every chance uh, to be able to succeed in the end. It means keeping people engaged. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're fighting for them. Thank you very much for your advocacy in Washington for the ACA and for, for the people of our nation. Um, I'm speaking as a practicing family physician of about 25 years experience, uh, formerly a solo independent doc, um, now working with a large multi-specialty group here in Madison, um, also involved with the Wisconsin Academy of Family Physicians. And one thing that really I think uh, a challenge that faces our specialty of family medicine is that of access and is that of, of recruiting people to the specialty. And my question is, with the ACA um, excitingly giving access, hopefully, to some 40 million Americans, who is going to provide that care? And, and the question then is, how do we attract good medical students to our specialty? Um, oh, many moons ago, when I graduated from medical school, there was a, a saying that the top third of the class went into research, the middle third of the class made good practicing physicians, and the bottom third of the class made all the money. Um, <laughs> now that's turned a little bit in that, in that the top third of the class sees the money and they go into the high paying, typically surgical subspecialties. Mm -hmm. How do we attract those bright students into primary care? I'd appreciate your thoughts. Uh, well, and, and when we were dealing with the um, early versions of the health care bill in the House, this was a, a, a big emphasis and I think we lost some of that emphasis in the final version of the bill, but um, a recognition, and you can look at Massachusetts' experience. They enrolled 300,000 new uh, folks, and the first thing they found is waiting lists to get in to see their, you know, oh, I've had insurance now. Uh, I'd like to see my primary care physician, and wait a second, there's a problem here. Um, so, you know, we definitely recognized that, that was going to be an issue. Um, you, you could speak to this better than me, but let me tell you what I've heard from primary care and family, um, family docs over the years. Um, one is that if there is one area in health uh, where compensation should be increased uh, uh, for physicians, it's certainly, I think, uh, in, in primary care fields. Um, uh, that that's one signal that you send, that we need, you know, there's a supply-demand issue, and it's also an issue of value if we're going to look at medical home models and who's going to be the, um, uh, and, and, you know, and if, the, if your mom should call first her primary care physician before her specialty physician, um, you have to send signals in that direction. I think part of it also deals with um, the lifestyle of and expectations we place on those in primary care and level of authority uh, within the larger system. So um, I certainly, not uh, some years ago, actually talked to um, researchers from this campus who were just talking about how during early rotations, uh, a lot of medical students check that off the list when they see the call schedule, the, um, the hours associated it for, with lot lower compensation than, than, other, um, than other areas that they get a taste of during their rotations. Um, and, you know, the, the demands placed, uh, especially it depends, if, I'm sure, on the setting. Um, but also the, this level of authority. If we do look at a primary care um, physician and their team as directing the care, especially with some of these innovative models that I was talking about in more detail earlier, 
you know, taking a team approach to managing individuals who are dual eligibles or who are um, uh, who have chronic conditions um, that need monitoring. Uh, that sort of authority, I think, also is um, an important piece of making the, um, the primary, primary care uh, practices more attractive. Um, and so I think those are all pieces of it uh, that we will see further developed as these pilots and demonstrations um, play forward. But, uh, you know, I, I see when we have 32 million more insured, I hope by the year 2014, um, that this will be a key um, element. Uh, there's certainly other sort of models of delivery, uh, and I don't, you know, I'm sure you've had discussions about this before, but um, where uh, uh, payment systems can be real realigned by you know, the co-op system where the primary care physicians are much more likely to be on salary than um, working with all the billing uh, that is um, inherent with multiple payers and that complexity, and some find that a lot more attractive. So I think that having those models of care delivery available to people who are going into, or more abundant when people are going into primary care is another important signal. Those are some of the things I would think of. Good morning, thank Good morning. you so much for uh, speaking with us. I wanted to give you some feedback. Good. One is that your legislation and this university is trying to do something that's never been done before with healthcare. We're trying to put together what we know with what we do with what we need. And that's a very new model. Mm -hmm. But I would like to say on the upside, Wisconsin does get it. And I think we did get a little coverage when we said so. So we're hoping that you will remember that Wisconsin is here and we do need to work more closely with you and the Democrats who are helping us to make sure that the United States remains a democratic, forward-thinking, progressive country it's always been. Small I'm, day democratic. <laughs> 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 and as a, I'm a professor in the School of Nursing and our, our outreach mission puts us first, second, and third through the door of the home. Mm -hmm. when people are trying to use the best of the best of the best and just make it. So we're hoping that it, when the models are pushing forward that you don't leave out the biggest army you have. Right. Thank you. Thank you. You just heard from, um, oh, sorry, do you want to say yeah. something? No, 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 I didn't know where the voice was coming from until I saw you, so go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, hi, thanks for hi. all your wonderful work. And I want to also say thanks for coming to the protests up at the Capitol. I saw you time and time again. It made such a difference. Thank you. Anyway, we... So thanks for that. And thanks to Maureen. I want to say in terms of a leader uh, on this campus for health services research, inclusive, I'm in pharmacy, inclusive with pharmacy and with nursing, you are amazing. So thank you very much. So let's acknowledge her. Um, the last two and a half days, I was at a very exciting conference that um, Paul Smith, who is in the Department of Family Medicine and Practice, organized with all of the researchers, or many researchers, who are involved in provider-based research networks of one kind or another. There are a whole slew of them here in Wisconsin. I, I'm so proud to be in Wisconsin yes. as part of this. So you've got, we've got these researchers really geared up, working across disciplines uh, in very innovative ways. And one of the things that was unsettling um, was that one of our plenary speakers told us that NIH is increasingly putting its money into basic research and not into applied research. So here we are, geared up, in Wisconsin to do these fabulous studies, interdisciplinary, looking at the translation and evaluating the innovative models. And what we're hearing is that the money is shifting, research-wise, into basic research and away from the sources of funding that we need to really um, evaluate and then sustain those innovative models that can be most 
uh, productive to consider in the future. So I feel clueless about how to, how to deal with that. And I wondered what advice, you're a politician, what advice do you have <laughs> for us out of it researchers on this? I was going to say, I'm, I'm a politician, but I just told you I was the granddaughter of a biochemist, and I'm also the niece of a biophysicist who has sat on more, she has sat on more NIH panels than uh, you can imagine. Uh, and, and so I've had that debate at, historically at family dinner tables of, you know, when we understand exactly how the cell works completely, we can solve every, you know, versus, you know, you, you know applied, uh, applied research. You know, I, one of the criticisms of the NIH over the years is that, um, that it has done incredible things, by the way, everyone in this room knows that, and there is nothing like it elsewhere in the world. NIH has driven such incredible discovery. Um, but over the years, one of the criticisms has been that its institutes are not mission driven. You know, so. It, it, the Cancer Institute has not been told that they must figure out the reasons for and the treatments of and the cures for cancer in 10 or 20 years. It, it, it's much more amorphous of learn more, discover more, help us progress, but it, you know, there, there hasn't been a concise mission. And I think if there were perhaps uh, the look at having a concise mission for all the various institutes, you would have to see the funding stream go from basic, uh, but also then translational and you know applied, uh, uh, and um, and and there's been resistance to to doing that. I don't see that happening in the near future, um, and I think that those resources may, uh, well, NIH panels occasionally will uh, uh, fund uh, projects and, and research that is more applied. Um, I don't think you're going to see a huge change, and so it may mean that we, we have to find those resources elsewhere. I mean, this isn't an unusual problem, I think, of um, commercializing things that happen, uh, discoveries that are made in laboratories in universities across, uh, and there's often some angel investment early on, and then this really uh, difficult period as you're going from uh, this discovery to, uh, you know, clinical trials with the FDA and ultimately getting um, something commercialized. I mean, I, I think we see the same in the, um, in the National Institutes for Health. Um, but uh, the other thing, and you said I'm a politician, so, you know, I, I, what, what's my solution? There has been huge resistance to politicizing the NIH. And I agree with that. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, uh, rejection of science by some politicians. Uh, I don't know that you want politicians directing with too heavy of a hand what uh, the NIH can choose to, to fund. Uh, you know, perhaps part of the problem is looking at the panels that make, that review the grants and make the decisions and making sure that some um, who are not just basic scientists are part of that decision making and, and screening process. Um, I haven't for a while looked at what the laws are with regard to constituting those, those grant making panels. Uh, but I, I think we have to figure out a way other than putting it squarely in the political arena to make some of the changes that you're, that you're talking about. Um, as we talk about the obstacles to health care reform, we naturally focus on partisan politics in the federal government, the problems in this, our state houses, the media, et cetera. Um, there's another end to the spectrum, and that's the folks who, in the end, our population are the people we're, we're trying to take care of in right. the right way. And I um, wonder about your thoughts about whether there's a, a problem with the American psyche, that is, if we could solve all the problems in Washington and, and the state, uh, and if we had a better media, um, we would nonetheless run into a huge problem with the implementation of health care reform because there's something about Americans that uh, makes distinguishes them from the rest of the world in terms of maybe a sense of immortality and certain fear of death and um, 
a, a sense of entitlement that simply isn't shared across the rest of this world. You, you get out there and talk to more people than most of us do, so, and you alluded to the August uh, two, 2009 sessions, and I wonder what you think about that. Ah, this is a great, huge question. <laughs> um, yes, we are a unique people. Uh, you know, many of you who know me for a, uh, a long time know that if I had a, a magic wand, I would have just done a single payer system. You know, expanded Medicare for everyone and worked out, you know, to strengthen it. But, um, and, and I just remember, you know, looking at, you know, talking to people about it, and we know that whatever we would do, you know, people reject the models from other countries, and we know it would have to be uniquely American. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, because li listen to how, to how uh, people from the U.S. vilify the Canadian system. Even though you talk to most Canadians who say, I wouldn't trade it for anything. We're proud of it. It's not perfect, but you know. Then you, but you, but they were successfully able to find, you know, the, the the person who had to wait a little longer. Where in the U.S., you know, you could get it right away if you could afford it, if you had the coverage, et cetera. You know, so all these ironies exist in our our society. Um, I do think we have. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, of difference. For example, uh, knowledge, perhaps because we're the lone superpower remaining in the world, but if you travel abroad, people know all sorts of details about um, U.S. politics and, uh, uh, you know, what's going on here. And, you know, then you, they could ask you, who's our leader? Do you know who we elected as our president or our prime minister? And we'd be, you know, and, and, because we're isolated geogra geographically by two large oceans from much of the rest of the world, um, because our history is only, uh, for most school children back, you know, oh, the discovery of the United States and your discovery of America and then, you know, the Revolutionary War, et cetera, and you travel elsewhere, um, I I'll give you just a quick glimpse when, um, when uh, when we were engaged in airstrikes in Kosovo, which was during my first term in office. And uh, uh, my colleagues and I were holding town meetings of, you know, what should, what should the U.S. role be in this, um, in this tragedy that's unfolding? And you'd have people in the audience who goes, well, if it weren't for what happened in 14-something, you know, and back and forth, and you saw, I mean, literally, this was still in the psyche of, of people who, um, traced their heritage and, and you know, from uh, Kosovo and Macedonia and uh, Albania. I mean, and, and if you travel the world, you'll, you'll find that. And it's something that, that we don't experience here. Uh, so yeah, there are lots of differences that make, uh, that make us unique. I also think that the divisions you see nationally and in our state are real, that we are a, a deeply and evenly divided country and, and people here in the state of Wisconsin. And, um, and so governing at times when those divides feel deeper uh, is a very complicated process. Um, but I think we spend too little time on figuring out what binds us together. I mean, the tactics of divide and conquer are so easy, tried and true, and that's what's being used right now in politics, where I swear I think, you know, progressives and Tea Party folks have more in common than they have that divides them if they'd stop and talk and listen to each other and, you know, everyone's struggling right now and they need to come together. So I'd like to build on a couple of the previous questions. Um, I think that we all recognize that we're entering into a time, or we're already in a time of constrained resources, and we have to make choices. Uh, I think that those of us in the healthcare field, the worst thing that we can do is set up competition among various um, factions within healthcare. I think um, attaining accurate knowledge 
making decisions based on that knowledge, being honest about it, is uh, absolutely essential. Um, but by the same token, we can't do that by ourselves. We have got to enfranchise the rest of society to recognize the benefits that they have realized from our advances. Um, and so rather than ask that one aspect of our enterprise uh, thrive at the cost of another, uh, I think it's important that we inform people you know, of all the benefits. And yet we're terrible at that. You know, I was reminded of this. My brother-in-law had emergency uh, appendectomy and was back at work in two days. Now that's a minor thing. You may think, oh, everyone now takes it for granted. You can have a laparoscopic appendectomy and go back to work. But if you think about what that used to entail before we had the technology to do those procedures, um, it was an enormous loss to the system to have somebody out of commission for such a long period of time. And yet we as the interface with the public are notoriously bad at reminding them that these advances were made possible by research. So mm -hmm. that's a little, you know, I think that that's important. As somebody in your position, what's, it, it strikes me that various parts of the electorate are more effective than others at getting their message across in a coherent way. What would your advice to us be in helping the rest of the American public recognize the advantages of learning to do what we do better and delivering that message to our policymakers. How can we do that best? Well, let me start sort of within the healthcare system before I make patients into the ambassadors of the healthcare system with the public officials. Is I think we can certainly do a much better job through some of the reforms that we're talking about today of making um, patients partners in these reforms. You know, you can't get the cost savings that you're looking for and the improvement in quality dealing with somebody, for example, who has a chronic condition, say diabetes, unless they are a partner in their care and feel very much like they have responsibilities. Now, you know, if you change the payment system so that management of that particular patient um, you know, there's expectations that you do it in the highest quality but most cost-effective way, and you're not going to get paid more if that person has unexpected readmissions, um, uh, has, um, you know, some sort of acute episode that could have been otherwise prevented. Um, but your payment then is going to be tied by them being compliant and partners in their own health and their own care. And the more that, um, especially with people who are going to present frequently in the healthcare system. I'm not talking just the very healthy patient who comes in once a year, but even they can be a better partner in their well-being. But the, you say the, the chronic patient, once we have a system that incorporates them as full partners, I think they are going to be much better ambassadors for um, uh, supporting the uh, system that they are being well served by and talking to others about what they've seen change over the years and why that's important that we support that. Um, uh, so I, I, I think it can, st you know, it can start within everybody's, um, to the extent that your practitioners, some of you are practitioners, start at that level and with an emphasis on some of the models that really do empower uh, patients um, to be full partners. And again, back even to the uh, even to the person who is in generally good health and is only being seen maybe once a year, well, they do need to be seen once a year, and you do need to, to uh, make sure that, um, that people are maintaining good health. And, uh, you know, there's too infrequently the comments about, well, do you smoke? Are you going to quit smoking? Uh, you know, you, you look like you could benefit from uh, losing a few pounds and can, can we help in that regard, those are often seen as, you know, not the primary business of, of, um, of a physician on an annual visit, et cetera. Um, and often not compensated for, I might add, which is, you know, changing the payment signals is going to be very important. Um, but, you know, the, the broader question, uh, 
And I actually thought you were going to be going in a slightly different angle with that question about uh, you know, patients uh, uh, becoming more politically active um, in defense of the Affordable Care Act and, for example, the individual mandate, which tends to be the, um, the, the, the biggest piece of controversy right now, especially as it winds its way through, um, through the court. Uh, we do have to do a better job of having people understand that we're all in this together and that all of us being a part of the system reduces the cost for everyone. Now, there's, there's winners and losers. There's no question about that in a reform as complicated as this. But the basic idea of insurance is that we all put in a little against the risk that any one of us is going to have incredible needs. Uh, be it uh, you know a, an illness or an injury, uh, and those who choose to stay out because I'm I'm healthy, I don't need it raises the costs for everyone else, and that's something that you know back to the American psyche, uh, you know we have we have our mavericks there that don't want to do that, but I think that the wisdom is so clear, and we have to be better at communicating it. Um, as it stands right now, uh, the federal deficit or federal debt is approaching fifteen trillion dollars, and healthcare, specifically Medicare and Medicaid, is the single biggest driver of the unsustainable spending that we are seeing. And this is something that's particularly concerning to me because I'm just starting out in the workforce, and it's my generation that is going to be paying down this debt. At a recent Republican presidential debate. Every single candidate raised their hand when asked if they would support, uh, when, when asked if they would oppose a measure that would bring the debt under control with uh, a 10 to 1 ratio of uh, spending cuts to tax increases, and they would oppose that. Essentially, their position is screw the poor. My question to you is how do you see bringing healthcare costs and bringing our debt levels to sustainable levels without just? taxing the rich? Um, I, it's been actually the subject of most of my talk, which is that the Affordable Care Act recognized as one of its key missions that if we were going to extend health care coverage to 32 million additional Americans that don't have coverage today, that we couldn't do so in a model that continued to spiral um, upwards in terms of cost, that we had to change and transform the way medicine was practiced. And <clears throat> so I outlined a number of the innovations um, that are being tested because of the passage of the Affordable Care Act that are intended specifically to bend that cost curve, to reduce uh, cost without jeopardizing quality, not only without jeopardizing, but hopefully to improve quality. I started out by talking a little bit about how the payment model of today rewards quantity of service over quality of service. It has no signals telling providers to collaborate, to work, to team together on patient care. It didn't draw on the best research for um, you know, comparative effectiveness. If we do all of those things, we are told from the Congressional Budget Office and the Office of uh, Management and Budget that does the uh, uh, scoring for the, for the uh, president that the results of the Affordable Care Act over two decades will be eliminating over a trillion dollars of our national debt. I think that's a huge contributor. And I guess what I would tell you is that I think it is unwise to do more cuts and more um, uh, tinkering with it until we've seen this through. Uh, because what if we're not successful with these demonstrations because we've uh, eliminated our capacity to even test these things? I really think we have to let the Affordable Care Act be fully implemented and fully, uh, uh, that we have to give a full uh, chance to these innovations to be tested and to be uh, 
disseminated more widely if we find they work. We were talking about Wisconsin as a leader on this. If all states uh, had uh, their systems of health care working as well as we do in Wisconsin, we would have a lot less debt in this nation than we do right now. Uh, you may have heard international studies that show that we spend roughly twice as much on health care per person than most other industrialized nations, and our outcomes are, are worse. But I asked uh, one of the presenters of this type of information to a group, of, a bipartisan group of members of Congress. I said, is the variance within the US as vast as it is between the US and other industrialized nations? And the answer was yes. We can show them how we do it here. And I'm not saying universally, not everyone has it right here. But if we can export some of our innovations, some of the ways that we've made uh, uh, success uh, in the or seen success in the past, we would be a long way towards reducing our national debt. So in the healthcare arena alone, that is one of the things that um, I would say to you. It'd be a little bit beyond the scope of our talk today for me to talk about other ways to balance the debt. But I will tell you, just from my own perspective, because I feel so strongly about it, that I do think it's time to end both of our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and bring those folks home. Um, my question kind of related to the one about Wisconsin being a resource for the Democrats. We also need to be a resource for the Republicans. Yes. And my question is, as advocates, individuals, how's the best way to reach our representatives? Do we do emails? Do we sign up on a mass petition? Does a personal letter writing thing work? And how about when you have constituents from e other areas writing to you? How well do you listen to those? And I'm sure it's a different um, answer from every individual member because they're going to do it different. But do you have a general feel of how's the best way to reach Congress? Well, I would first of all say um, any way is a good way. Uh, it's all better than being silent. To express to your elected representatives what you care about, what you feel, what you want them working on, however you do it, is more important than keeping silent and just wishing they would get it. Um, but I certainly think that there are ways, depending on how much time and energy you have, that are more persuasive than others. Uh, I certainly note when I get a petition calling for something how many constituents have signed it. But a story, whether you write it in a letter or email or you make an appointment to visit or you see that person in the airport or in the grocery store, is so powerful. I mean, I, I, I don't forget these. Uh, I, I, um, I retell them oftentimes. In fact, part of what I used to do during the healthcare debate is just read healthcare stories from my constituents on the floor. I just reserve an hour in the evening and say, Julie from Beloit wrote me to say such and such. And, you know, because it is really, it's powerful stuff. Um, I do think, you know, when you can uh, uh, have a chance to speak with an elected representative face to face, that's the best. Um, but I know that everyone doesn't have that um, amount of time uh, or, or the capacity to get time off work, et cetera, to do so. But anyway, I, I, the first thing I would say is just make sure that you communicate. And then as you have more time, as you have more ability to uh, do so in, in the more personal ways that you can. And, and to answer your question about, um, I think most House members these days probably um, look first to communications from their own constituents. Um, I hear from roughly 4,000 a month. And so reading uh, letters beyond that from, from other areas of the state or country becomes a little more challenging. Certainly, they're unlikely to be answered. Besides um, saying Tammy, go back to D.C. and get this done. 
I'm reminded in the spirit of the Health Innovative Program, Innovation Program, that m my part is to uh, utilize the funding uh, for research that actually uh, replicates the, uh, the population that we're trying to serve so that the providers can be excited and say, you know, that's something that I can actually use for my patients. What else I'd like to ask you, though, is um, how do you propose to find any middle ground for your uh, legislation uh, when you do go back to Washington? Is there middle ground? I, there is, and uh, I would say, you know, even back to the example that I gave you of working across the aisle on the issue of end-of-life planning, that was thoroughly bipartisan until someone got a hold of it, not even in the, in, in the Congress, but you know, some, somebody out there who wanted to run with this and demonize uh, what we were doing. But on a daily basis, I work across party aisle uh, to um, work on usually much more specific, not as large as the whole health care uh, debate. And in fact, every uh, measure uh, Maureen was talking about that I'd had signed into law was bipartisan. You don't pass bills unless you are able to work in a bipartisan basis in a, an institution that is partisan. I had a bill passed earlier this year, um, one of the few uh, Democratic bills that have passed the House of Representatives, but on a public health issue related to um, our, one of our many workforce sh shortage issues of not having enough veterinarians going into public health. When you look at all the human health threats that are first animal born, you know, avian flu, H1N1, uh, you know, they're key partners in the public health arena. And, uh, you know, I had uh, great bipartisan support for that. Um, working on uh, issues related to uh, uh, focus on our critical care infrastructure in the country, great bipartisan support. Um, I'm working on a uh, number of behavioral health issues, again, able to find bipartisan support. So I think, especially when you work at the smaller level where uh, people are persuaded because they have constituents who are struggling with the same issues or they hear from uh, providers that they uh, trust and uh, have long-time relationships that are on the same page, there are things that can, can move forward. Uh, so it's not as bad as it looks, but remember it's also being filtered through this media that I was talking about earlier that would like to make you think that nothing at all. No conversations happen. We sit at opposite sides of the chamber and don't talk to each other. Um, but it needs to get better than that. It's, it's not enough to have these small conversations. We've got to pull together around the larger struggles, whether it's in health care or um, just the general challenges that are facing our society right now. So we, we have a long way to go, but it is happening. And as you have breakthroughs, as you find something that's going to significantly improve health care, if it were adopted more widely, share that with me, share that with your Republican member of the House or whoever it might be. Um, but no, this is something that isn't a Democrat-Republican issue. This is something that's going to help human health, help uh, population health in, in our country. Thank you so much. Well, uh, I'd like to thank Congresswoman Baldwin for her wonderful conversation. I'd like to also thank all of you for coming this morning and encourage you to get another cup of coffee.
and uh, wander through the posters that look at some of the terrific health services research that our investigators in the Health Innovation Program have done over the last 10 years. Thank you.